Yeah, okay, this is our guest lecture number four. The topic of today's guest lecture is the data center fundamentals, which is a prerequisite for the cloud computing. And this guest lecture will be conducted by Honorable Mr. Suhas Gadekar, who happens to be our departmental students from 1992 batch. So I request all the participants to please log in to this session because within five minutes we'll be starting our session. <clears throat> I request all the BSc 1 students, BSc 2 students, and BSc 3 students to join this particular guest lecture. It is one of the most important guest lectures so far we have conducted because this topic is related to the current trends which are taking place in the field of electronics and computer science. So data science has been one of the key areas uh, in the present trend, trends in the electronics and computer science. So I request all the BSc students, non-electronic students, those who are interested in computer science and electronics, they can actively take part in this particular session. This is the banner which we have designed. I am happy to tell you that Sri Shivaji Mahavidyalaya Barshi has received a grant of rupees almost 1 crore and 89 lakh under the DBT Star College scheme. Okay, and we run this scheme for three years. And after three years, our college was selected for DBT Star College status. Okay. So after the scheme, we have received one another key achievement that is the DBT Star College status, which is a very honorable for our uh, honor for our institute because it is one of the it is only one college in the Solapur University who has received this DBT Star College status. So we all all should be happy. We all uh, alumni and the present students, BSc students, they must be very much <coughs> happy that our college is one of the top colleges in the India, we can say, because only 26 colleges received this grant and Shivaji College is one of them. So I will be very happy to share this uh, good thing with you.
So the Suhas I have joined. So we have everything. Suhas, so yes, 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 sir. I have joined. Yeah. Yes. Good afternoon. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. <clears throat> okay. So we shall start the session just now. <clears throat> uh, this is our fourth guest lecture. Okay. And the topic of today's guest lecture is the data fundamentals, which is a prerequisite for the cloud computing, which is the which is now the top area in the field of computer science and electronics. <clears throat> Uh, before we start the session, I will welcome all the uh, gear, all the participants who have taken actively active part in this session, as well as I welcome the guest also. I request <coughs> Professor Dr. U R Bhodke to give his welcome speech on this occasion. Over to you, Dr. Bhodke, sir. Hello everyone, good afternoon to all. On behalf of Department of Electronics, Sri Shivaji Mahavidyalaya Barsi, it gives us an immense pleasure to welcome Honorable President of today's guest lecture, respected Dr. P. R. Thorat sir, Principal of Sri Shivaji Mahavidyalaya Barsi. Also, it gives us an immense pleasure to welcome to today's resource speaker, Honorable Mr. Swas Gadekar, Senior Software Architect at Oracle from USA. I also welcome to my colleagues, participants, and students. I also welcome remaining it, uh, welcome to our science coordinator, Dr. T.M. Lokhande, sir, and other faculty members from our college. To grace the occasion of the guest lecture on data center fundamentals as a prerequisite for cloud computing, organized by the Department of Electronics, Sri Shivaji Mahavidyalaya Barsi. Sri Shivaji Mahavidyalaya Barsi approved star college status from Department of Biotechnology, Ministry of Science and Technology, India. So first of all, I am thankful to Mr. Suhas Gadeko for accepting our invitation to deliver guest lecture on data center fundamentals as a prerequisite for cloud computing from his Buji Seidol. I am quite confident that the guest lecture will provide a very good platform to all the teachers, all the participants, and all the students from BSc 1, 2, and 3 electronic students to exchange ideas, discuss new trends, discuss new challenges and new approach in electronics field as well as information and technology. The objective to arrange the guest lecture on data center fundamentals for cloud computing is to enrich the current trends in the electronics subject and recent trends in the science and technology to motivate the students to pursue better career opportunities in electronics field as well as IT sector. The purpose of this guest lecture to familiarize students with the upcoming area of cloud computing and its applications. The aim of this guest lecture is to bridge the gap between study materials and practical exposure and the students will be benefited 
from the electronic science knowledge and the students will be design develop solutions for modern tool uses and life long so i am sure that you all will feel enriched with this knowledge after completion of this event i hope mr swas gadekar's talk may become more informative motivating and inspirable to all of us i welcome all once again to this guest lecture and i hope that you all will have a great time ahead i wish a grand success to his to this guest lecture on data center fundamentals as a prerequisite for cloud computing thank you all thank you dr gorke for your welcome speech <clears throat> now it's time to introduce our guest today's guest mr swas gadekar i would like i would be very happy i will be very happy to tell you that uh, mr swas gadekar he is our departmental student he completed his bsc in electronics uh, in 1992 uh, from our department okay after after which he completed his msc in electronics in shivaji university kolhapur and after that uh, he joined the sun microsystems uh, as a project engineer and i think he eventually worked there for 10 10 years almost and after that he switched over to oracle system so it will be great honor for me to introduce one of our students mr swas gadekar so this is a brief introduction for him swas gadekar who has 25 years of it experience and he is currently leading a team of software architects at the oracle he is actively involved in the architecture design and implementation of various oracle products based on the microservices service oriented architecture distributed systems and utilizing cloud computing prior to the oracle he worked at sun microsystems for the creators of creator of java programming language and contributed he contributed to various java based projects he is a sun certified java programmer certified web service developer and oracle certified cloud architect associate apart from this official work he also loves watching the cricket and he is a practicing meditator so this is a very brief introduction about our today's chief guest mr suhas gadeka i request today's guest to please take over the session and start his lecture over to gadekar sir please okay thank you sir for such a good introduction good afternoon everyone can you see me yeah. okay all right so what we will do is actually i will uh, uh, after some time after a brief introduction i will stop my video sharing and we'll get into the presentation so this is just a brief introduction right i think you know i am also one of you guys just that in 92 as sir sir said that's when i completed my bsc from the college uh, so I, I i can relate to most of you right i mean 20, 27 29 years ago that's where you i was like you know where you are currently uh, so I, I have this special connect, right? Don't worry about like, you know, yeah, this is Suhas Kadekar, senior software architect and accomplished and worked in the industry, right? I have gone through a lot of pain to create a presentation in a manner that all of you would understand. Uh, Deshmukh sir were very particular to me, uh, Godke sir. They told me that the students are from BSE first year as well. So I don't want to lose you. 
right in in the technical material that i am going to present i know that you are learners you are in the first year you have just gotten into the bsc first year electronics whereas the last year students are more familiar with it right so what i am going to do is actually there would be some slides in my presentation which i have created deliberately for first year students or for, for students who are like you know may not be having much knowledge about this because the the uh, what i don't want to happen in this presentation is that you should not feel lost right at the end of the presentation as gurkesar said you should go back with some knowledge right and you will find out more about what is in a data center what is it like and how it becomes a prerequisite for cloud computing uh, i have been asked to have another session as well on the cloud computing and we will talk about that one in a future session but currently we will focus more on data centers so let me stop sharing my screen and i will go to the presentation uh, but before that like you know don't wait until the end you can ask me questions any time right stop me just unmute yourself ask the questions or ask the questions on the chat i may not be paying much attention to the chat as i, I would be talking so just get my attention by speaking out loud or so don't worry about it and uh, we will stop and get into the details of it right and like i said i don't want to lose you in the technical material i have gone through a lot of pain to create slides so that you will understand in particular right i i know as uh, deshmukh sir explicitly told me that there are going to be students from the first year as well and i didn't want you to uh, like you know feel lost in this presentation even though the topic is challenging right there is so much that is happening in the cloud computing world but we have to start somewhere right and this is the right age uh, who knows i mean like you know the success of this talk is if a few of you got the inspiration from this to do more into the uh, data centers and cloud computing and take this one or if it helps develop a passion for this field for you i think that is a success that's how i would define uh, a success for this presentation so uh, without further ado then let me stop my video and uh, what i will do is actually go to the presentation uh, before we go to the presentation uh, let me think of the slides first and we'll again go to that one right so this is my presentation don't worry about making notes as i speak because what i will be doing is i will be sending all this presentation material to uh, to deshmukh sir and gurke sir and they will you can get the copies of uh, soft copy of this uh, presentation from sir right so don't worry about like you know rather pay attention right that is more important make some notes because everything that i would be speaking about may not be on the presentation slides right so make some notes as you go along right ask questions uh, uh, but that that's what i would say be attentive because there is a lot of material that we are going to cover right so uh, the talk is about the data center fundamentals right which is a prerequisite for cloud computing right people could directly tell you to about cloud computing but i thought that no this is not a right approach for our bsc first year second year third year students right i think it should be like you know how you academically learn about it right you incrementally learn the foundation of a subject and then you build the knowledge on top of it right so that is the approach that we want to take and uh, so let's understand about data center fundamentals and then we will get into the cloud computing the other analogy that i uh, when i was discussing with deshmukh sir i told is this data center fundamentals if you understand about this one understanding cloud computing from an engineering perspective would be very easy right think about the perspective here right perspective is like you know let's say you are going to buy a car right there are two types of people right one type of people is like you know uh, i just want to buy a car right i like you know what is the price what is the color how does it this look like and uh, how how fast it can go what kind of security features it has that is one perspective the second perspective is more of an engineering perspective what is inside a car really right how does it work what is an engine what is how does the engine functions right what is uh, uh, the all the new things that is like what are the airbags what is the front wheel drive versus rear wheel drive versus all wheel drive right so that is an engineering perspective 
Now, if you just go do a Google search and decide to learn about cloud computing, you would be bombarded with marketing material. You would not be knowing about the engineering details of it, right? Another analogy could be, let's say you go to see a Taj Mahal, right? One way is to just be fascinated by a Taj Mahal, how beautiful it looks like, what a fantastic symmetry is there. And the another perspective to look at it is, how is it constructed? Right? So the, this is the lateral category where we form, right? How? That is more important topic uh, that we want to uh, dwell upon. So data center fundamentals. Uh, here is just a standard disclaimer since I will be sharing this presentation with you that the pres disclaimer says that this presentation is only for educational purpose. It is not meant for legal, commercial or professional use, right? And views expressed here are my own and do not in any way represent views of Oracle. This is a mandatory per our company policy that whenever we are talking outside of the company, Hello? we are supposed to indicate this one. So uh, they just cover themselves from the legal perspective. Right. So as I said again, do not hesitate to interrupt me. Just raise your voice, ask the question. OK, so let's begin. Uh, what here is the agenda of my topic today in the agenda what I'm going to do is going to explain about what is a data center architecture layout and then what are the building blocks of the data center right data center components what are racks servers and network storage you will learn a lot in the process so don't worry about it at this stage but this is just to outline how the presentation will progress right and what are the advancements happening and the basics of virtualization and cloud computing that I decided to drop at this stage because I felt the material was becoming too much and we would not be able to cover that much uh, in, in the first presentation. I will be coming back again for cloud computing presentation and I will, I will touch base on the uh, virtualization and cloud computing at that time. So what is a cloud computing? Uh, what is a data center? A data center looks like this, right? But even anything that you want to learn in science, they say that pictures speak thousand times more than words. Take a look at the picture first. What is it? How does it look like? Right? Take a tour of it. Right? So data center in the simplest terms is a space for hosting your IT infrastructure. IT infrastructure could include your computer systems, network for that storage power supplies and ups and everything else right so in a simplest term you can say your laboratory is like a data center yes because your laboratory is is having computers having your laboratory equipment it just not we would not call it as a so as uh, just i'm interrupting you yeah 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 go ahead sir. the screen is not visible oh my god <laughs> Please, uh, share oh yeah yeah please please sir thank you about that one sir <laughs> yeah yeah okay all right can you see my screen now yes sir yes sir. Yeah. okay wow I, what a what a mistake sir <laughs> thank you for pointing it out okay all right so this is the topic right this is just a disclaimer we just talked about that as per my company policy we are required to have that one in our presentations uh that the views expressed here are mine and not that of the company right here is our agenda we would be talking about data center what is what are the components of the data center rack servers network and we'll talk about that don't worry about it but this lays out the plan for our uh, like you know next hour uh, 90 minutes whatever time it takes right advancements in the data center uh, basics of virtualization is what i would be talking about and then how it ties to the cloud computing uh, but this topic I, I i felt that virtualization covering that would take a little longer so i will just briefly talk about that one and then we will have that one continuation in the future presentation what does a data center look like right this is a picture from an aisle in a data center so what you see on the left and right side are computer servers right and we'll talk about the servers they are connected uh, like you know there you would see the air cooling up there and and other things right there is network there is storage and all other related uh, connectivity items to operate the computer servers are there but rather than doing this one 
what I thought of doing is there is just a two minute video of a data center and then we will see the underpinnings of the data center, right? So is it okay, sir, if I do a quick video share? I, I don't know how the yes, quality sir. would be. Yes, sir. just go ahead. Okay. okay, all right. So look at, this is going to be a presentation on data center. Uh, sorry, the video YouTube small presentation. There are so many data center virtual tools, but I deliberately chose a simpler one so that it, you will be able to connect to the presentation based on this one. And we will take a look at the same tour towards the end of the presentation. It will make much more sense to you at the end of the presentation, right? But for now, just pretend that data center, as I said, is a dedicated space in a building, right? Just like how you have laboratories, right? Physics lab, electronics lab, computer science lab, right? So in data center is like an infrastructure storage location, right? And that infrastructure storage location will contain your computer servers and networking equipment and storage and power supplies and everything else, right? To support the operation. Uh, but let's take a look at, look at data center tour, which is a simpler one, right? I gave a very, very simple analogy of a lab, but industries have a different setup for it. So let's take a look at this one first. Sure, customers' needs are met for the foreseeable future. This is the data. Sir, is the audio of the YouTube presentation available to you? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. It is visible and it is audible, but just increase the volume. Okay, okay. All right. Let me increase. Okay. Center. Located at our headquarters in Clovis, New Mexico, and with the nearest one several hours away, we built our state-of-the-art data center to provide you with the safety and security for your business data needs. Entering the building requires a key card, but access to the data center itself requires a two-factor authenticator only given to the necessary few. It's so secure that our own CEO doesn't even have access himself. All the access to the data center is tracked, and as an added layer of security, cameras are equipped to monitor the activity throughout the room. Our equipment pods contain redundant remote cooling systems with temperature monitoring in each rack. The pods also utilize hot aisle containment in order to further improve cooling efficiency. The in-row cooling isn't the only one with a scare. Plateau ensures that the data center never sees a loss of power by having not one, but two Caterpillar generators that are each capable of powering the full load of the data center. Additionally, our data center has two fully redundant electrical rooms, each equipped with a 250 kilowatt Schneider Electric UPS. These constantly monitor the electricity sources and automatically feeds the data center with power while the generator is starting up during a commercial power disturbance. Inside the pod, each server is connected to this redundant power supply, color-coded with yellow for A and green for B. A backup for our backup's backup. Now that's reliability. We understand that accidents happen. But in order to mitigate that risk, our data center comes with a fire suppression system that is equipped to detect when a fire starts, warn anyone inside, and then extinguish that fire through chemical and physical mechanisms without affecting oxygen levels. The data center pod was also built upon a raised floor with a leak detection system. This system can report a leak right down to the specific tile labeled by the corresponding lettered and numbered walls. In order to prepare the equipment, we have the Make Ready Room. We're setting up servers to test and burn in before being placed in the pod. In addition to your data needs, as a data center client, you have access to our emergency operations room. Located in the same secure area, this space is available for general access when not reserved for emergency use. Hello.
okay so that ends the present uh, that ends the youtube now here you can see a full spectrum of what i would consider azure data centers it might not be what you were thinking of you were probably thinking of okay all right so let's you just took a tour of the data center right any uh, any questions on that i i do raise the questions right but i think you know we'll know more as we as we go along uh, let's go to the next slide that is a physical layout of a data center now you just saw a data center so it, it is you just like at least saw the building structure right and this is just a physical layout of the data center so if you look at the physical layout this is a layout of a building and then you would see in the picture here right the there is a ups room on this side right there is power distribution unit then here uh, there are like you know racks and these boxes black colored boxes that you see that's where your computer servers will be stored and you will immediately have a question what is a server versus what is a normal computer and we will have that all of that right but just look at at like you know from a perspective of like you know as a, as a normal visitor how the data center would look like you saw the video and now you see the layout of the plan just like how a building layout is right so this is this is a uh, these are different black colored things are racks and this is the picture that you are seeing right this is the aisle in between so you can imagine that is you are standing over here where my mouse is right and on the left hand side and right hand side are these these racks okay uh, so this is this is a physical typical layout many servers there in a module in a rack and then there is a room separately created just for monitoring this monitoring is is like you know contains the temperature sensors temperature monitoring environmental monitoring how, what is the humidity level and all details like temperature levels and is there any server having a temperature heating problem is the disk drive perhaps failed all that detection happens in this location right so there is a team working within the data center and trying to keep this up and running okay any question on the physical layout we will get into the uh, the fundamental components of it right but like i said raise the questions immediately don't hold back okay so data center resources right i think you know it contains a lot of things from power supply units to other things but we are going to look at it more from an electronics computer science perspective so uh, so i decided to cover these resources in particular racks servers storage infrastructure network infrastructure and computing resources so until now you may be thinking that oh how is this related to electronic but we are getting into it right so now we will get into my I, earlier idea was that we'll talk about racks first and then the servers right but i decided to change that order just a little and i'm going to talk about computer first right because what goes inside a rack right you saw these racks here these are the black colored racks within that you are going to store servers but see i am using the term as server versus a personal computer or a desktop computer or a laptop for instance right what is a server but before we understand server let's understand what is inside a computer right now look at this picture this picture is is like you might have seen a computer like this a desktop computer right these are still in use many people are having this desktop computers laptop is also not very different right these are the components on the right hand side within that computer but if you look at the case if you open the case what you would notice here is at the top left corner there is a psu power supply unit right that power supply unit gives the power to the cpu which is the which is the there is a motherboard on which there is a cpu so how does a motherboard look like it is over here in this picture on the on the right hand side and in the motherboard you would see that there is this white colored thing that is where your cpu goes okay on the left hand side there are different cards in this cards we can extend the function of the motherboard right the motherboard can only do uh, the cpu processing memory and other things but how do you connect to the 
monitor how do you connect to the keyboard how do you connect to the speakers so if you look at this sound card right i would insert a sound card in this slot and connect the cable from the sound card to the speakers and guess what i have the sound coming from my computer to the speakers i have a video card here i can insert the video card in there and then i can take a vga cable from the video card connect it to my connect it to the back of my monitor and i have a display i have to connect to the internet right what i would do i will have a network card insert the network network card in this slot and i would have a ethernet cable that will go to my wifi router or like you know the other ethernet base based routers and i will have a internet connectivity right another thing is the hard drive there right there is a ram is also shown this is the uh, random access memory some of you may be learning about ram rom eprom eprom we will we'll touch base on that one as well briefly but this is a random access memory right when the power goes off the data from that one goes away that is the type of that memory ram memory whereas hard drive is a memory which is like more of a persistent memory even if the power goes off your data is still saved on the hard disk right and how does that work there are advancements in that as well we will take a look at that one right but the basic thing is that it is like you know the old hard drives were based on the magnetic platter and a head on that that one so we'll, we'll talk about storage in the next slide uh, you would see that there is a cd rom as well and uh, there is a cpu processor shown in here what is not shown on this left hand side picture is that there is a cpu fan also right because cpu contains the, that is the brain of the computer right that contains so many transistors on the chip when the 486 cpu came up in the market we had crossed a million transistors right 1 million is 10 lakh transistors on one chip came up the first time right then that is like you know ages ago right now it is way beyond that so that those many transistors so this one heats up so it needs a cpu fan also so there is a fan on that one and you would see that there is a computer fan generally to cool down the temperature within this one if the temperature goes up the electronic components could fail right that's why we have to the temperature maintaining the temperature within the data center within the computer also is so so important right because of the temperature component failure could occur right and that could cause a disruption in the service right a disruption in service is what business is looking after for you as a student it may not be of much importance what may happen your computer has broke is broken you may think oh my computer is broken who is impacted only you are impacted right you might go get your friend's computer or get someone's laptop or go find somewhere work in a um, like you know a shared space or work in a lab and get your job done but that is not the case for many many industries if their computer fails there is a disruption in service right think about the airline industries think about the medical industries right that it is so important that we are providing a sustained service right that it should not fail now you think about it right we are having a hard disk here to store the data even if the power goes off but if the power goes off then what will happen this computer is dead right if the power goes off or if the network goes off if you have a network connection and if somebody is connecting you are connecting from this computer to the network or somebody is coming connecting to your computer from the network and if the network cable is pulled off or if the network is having a problem the connectivity is gone right so it is very very important to keep this one continuously running and and we will get into the details of that one right what is what is needed but any questions on this picture because this introduce perhaps you uh if you have not seen how how a pc looks like inside this is how it looks like right you open the case and you would see a motherboard fan power supply unit right motherboard and there is ram on the motherboard to which the cpu stores the memory right uh, some of you last year students may be familiar with the uh, 8085 86 cpu is is that for last year or is that for second year now when we were in the when we were in bsc i think it was at the last year so are you having 8085 for syllabus now yes sir for second year for second year very okay. good okay. very good very good and then uh, so you know now right 8085 computer 
has eight data lines coming out of it right which we call as a data bus and address bus and control bus so these are different wires coming out of this this uh, cpu right which we call as a system bus then right so if there are eight data bus lines coming out of that cpu it is called as a 8 bit computer 8 bit cpu right so 8085 as you know is how many uh, 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 the lines in the data bus 8 so it is called as a 8 bit right and if you think about 8086 which came up later on that has how many is it for last year uh, 8086 or it is not there for last year 8086 no no it is not there now not there yet okay so what happens is this 8 bit is you can think like eight wires coming out of this cpu right there are pins for the cpu some of you might have seen it 8085 has eight data lines coming out of it so we call it as a 8 bit cpu then as the continued development happened because what happens this this eight data lines is what we use to get the data from the memory okay so if you have like only eight data lines to get the then it will be getting only in one clock you will only get eight bits which is a one byte correct so you would need one clock to get one byte you would need another clock to get two bytes another clock to get three bytes but what if we increase the data bus size from 8 to 16 wouldn't it be double the speed wouldn't we, wouldn't we access the data from the memory at a faster speed right so that's what happened then 8085 was a 8 bit computer but that was considered slow right so the next next cpu that came from intel was 8086 and that had a 16 bit but that was also very um, slow for many functions right then the 386 computer came 186 286 came as cpus in between but 386 CPU came and that had a 32 bit data bus. So now you can imagine, apart from the internal enhancements, just the speed of fetching the data from the memory, instead of fetching it like, you know, eight, eight bits one time, another eight bits, another eight bits, and four clocks, you are in a zip fetching 32 bits of data, four bytes of data. Right, so your CPU is not more now more performant, and your computer speed could be better. But that was also not adequate. Right, later on the Pentium chip came, and now we had a 64-bit bus, 64-bit data bus. Right, so that gave us an ability to read the data from memory faster, and like you know, open the door for supporting this higher CPU consuming processes and, and uh, games and other scientific research and other things was possible because of this faster processing speed now. Then what happened is actually, then even beyond 80, uh, the Pentium, it, it stopped. You will not find a CPU that is six, beyond 64 bit, right? That is the 64 bit CPU was the last is the Pentium. So after Pentium, did Intel stop making 128 bit then? If you are increasing by uh, eight multiples of 8 bit, 64 bit, 128 bit, no, there is no 128 bit CPU. Then Intel realized that it is becoming complex. So what they decided to do is within a CPU, you have a core. So core is like, you know, once you fetch an instruction from memory, you execute. It is not very different from like you know what you do in in solving let's say a computer problem right you if you are asked to add two numbers what do you do you read the first number and now that is in your mind right then you go and read the second number now you have two numbers in your mind and then you add the two numbers right who is doing the addition of the numbers your brain is doing the addition of the numbers right that's what the cpu does but before that it had to page to those two numbers Correct. And where did it fetch from? It fetches that from memory. Okay. And adds the two numbers together. And that addition is that's where, like, you know, the execution unit of the CPU comes into picture. So you can think that within the CPU, there is an execution unit, and that is called as a core. 
the address fetching is the same right and then like you know there is a core but then in intel what they decided to do is within the cpu add the cores meaning it is like as if uh, there are like you know one person in a room and somebody is giving task to him right fetching the uh, like you know whatever is the work needs to be done he goes gets that work from outside and gives it to this one person this one person works on that task and completes it right so the person within the room is only one the person which is fetching from outside is another one so you can think of two two persons here right one is getting the data from outside and giving it to the person within the room and then the person within the room is doing the work on that whatever is given to him what if there are two people in the room three people in the room four people in the room that is a core right so cpu the intel decided to add cores in the cpu and after pentium now the new chips came which you you may be hearing about like you know intel i3 i5 i7 have you heard about these terms when you are buying laptop or computers like you would come across those terms if you haven't already right but that is that is like you know goes inside the it, that is the new cpu now any any questions on this picture we will go to the next one but this covered a lot i kept bsc first year students in mind and i just wanted to wanted them to not lose in the subsequent conversation so i i decided to add this one feel free to ask questions guys right don't wait for a long if you don't understand anything okay okay all right let me go to the second slide again so now here what i'm going to talk about is now you understood right what this computer is what is inside a computer right and what we are going to talk about is now is a servers so what is the difference between a pc desktop or server if you look at the picture on the left hand what you see is a desktop laptop or workstation this is your personal computer this is how it looks like right do you see this one and on the right hand side is a picture of a server the way i have represented the picture is like you know this is the uh, uh, the front side of the server this is the back side of the server at the bottom right and if you open the case of a server how it would look like okay so on the left hand side is a personal computer or a desktop on the right hand side is a server picture so the one thing to note here is don't go by the size of the picture it is not scaled correctly okay so this desktop computer could be pretty much like one and a half to two feet high also this this height over here right whereas this one is a thin one if you have if you are having 8085 and if you are still following that rs gaukar's book if you put the gaukar's book next to this one that book will be thicker than this one on the right hand side what you see as a server right so you can imagine that this is more of a horizontal one right and thickness is about 2 cm or or so 2 to 3 cm that's it right and uh, this length could be about 19 18 cm and this could be about right uh, 10 uh, 12 to 15 17 cm so you can see this is a server right what are the other differences that you would notice compared to a desktop and a server a desktop has a display right this one doesn't have a display it has no display this has a keyboard also i have not shown in the picture in the left hand side server doesn't even have a keyboard then the fundamental like what is the use of it then if it doesn't even have a keyboard if it doesn't even have a desktop uh, it doesn't even have a display so how do i interact with it right so the interaction with the server happens from over the network so there are cables running out of this one and at a different place you will have another computer right which could be your laptop or desktop and from that one you would connect to the server is that clear that see that there is server doesn't have a display server doesn't have a keyboard right you are remotely connecting to it so this would be in a lab and there would be a, a wire running from that one just just for simplicity purpose connecting to your computer and from your computer you are connecting to that server and using that one 
is that at least the fundamental difference clear right okay so in your desktop let's talk about cpu a little uh, before before the cpu let me talk about the power what what is the use of a server then servers are designed for continuous operation they should be running for 24 7 right um, whereas desktop is you can shut off the laptop la desktop when you are done with your work laptop you can just carry wherever you want right that is not the case with your servers they need to be continuously running let's pretend that now our college has uh, an admission process and we have a data center of our own in college and uh, if we are having uh, the web application that we created online application to register and that is on a desktop computer and if the power of the computer goes off what will happen website is down correct there is only one power plug to this desktop you saw that one in the previous picture right so if i hold on just a second okay so in, in here you saw that there is only one power supply unit there is only one fan right if there is a failure in this power supply unit what happens your desktop is dead right the power goes off your desktop is dead this is a disruption in service this is not acceptable in business right it may be acceptable in in, in the college also you can we can clearly say that all right the site is down there is nothing we can do you try after some time it is acceptable in some cases it is not at all acceptable because a shutdown in service means loss of business for many industries right it could be mission critical it could be a military installation also right if we if our servers are scanning for missile intrusion into our space and if the server power goes off can we say that like you know oh missile came and hit our country just because there was a power outage and we were using a desktop there was no power outage though either but the power supply failed that is not acceptable at all right so that those are those systems are called as mission critical you cannot have shut them down even for a moment right so we need to prepare those and if you look at this picture now this is thinner server but if you look at this picture in this this part in particular you would see that there is a fan where my mouse is and next to that there is a power plug another fan and another power plug what does that indicate both will be connected even if the power goes off one one the other will be in use right so even if the power supply unit within the computer fails it will automatically switch over to the second one and there will not be any disruption in service so you would see that your normal computer will have only one power supply unit server will have two ethernet card also ethernet is the, the way you connect your computer to the internet and so there is no one connection point here there are more than one what is the benefit of that even if the connectivity on one goes down another one is there right any any questions on this one this is how a server look look like okay then let's talk more about cpu within a server computer and cpu within a desktop computer so this is where you can make a note perhaps that intel xeon is used for servers versus i5 i7 i9 is used for desktop so you may wonder what is the difference here i5 i7 i9 are next chips after the pentium from intel right and i is not for intel by the way i will explain the meaning of that but as it continued to evolve intel kept on incrementing the number i5 was having two cores i7 was is having like you know two uh, four cores i3 is having two cores i then i9 has even eight cores now right eight cores is like eight brains within the cpu now so simultaneous execution is possible right so you can as simple as like as i give you the analogy of a room right there are eight people working with worker eight people uh, working on a task within a room so that will be faster 
right? So there are cores, that's what I5, I7, I9 does. But how many cores? I5 will give you two cores, I7 will give you four cores, I9 can even go up to eight cores, right? And another measure of increased speed is the increased clock cycles, right? With, with every clock, they just change in state, zero to one, one to zero, that state has change happens. And higher the clock speed, higher the CPU speed, but there is a limit to increasing the CPU speed also, right? You cannot just keep on increasing the speed if there are technical challenges there. That's why the idea of cores came into picture that, oh my God, I cannot increase the um, uh, beyond like, you know, four gigahertz, five, six gigahertz, right? So now what do we do? We, it's just getting difficult and difficult technically to increase the clock speed, right? So what do we do there? We get more people to work within a chip. That is more brains to work within a chip, which we call as cores, right? Those cores are within the I5, I7, I9. But what is Xeon then? Why use Xeon here? And why use I5, I7, I9 here for the desktop? The thing is, Xeon is also like a Pentium, next generation of Pentium, just like these guys are. But the benefit of Xeon is, Xeon can get give you up to 48 cores, 48 brains are possible within a Xeon. You see the difference? So server could be very powerful. How many cores? 48 cores, I'm saying. Right? So even though it is a single CPU, it is like assuming there are 48 CPUs running within a CPU and doing things faster. Whereas with your i5, i7, i9, it's only, it could go up to four or eight cores. Second difference that you would think is each CPU is limited with how much memory it can access. So this i5, i7, i9 can go up to only 32 GB RAM, right? So memory is required for a computer to be more powerful. How much memory it can access up to 32 gigabyte on your desktop or laptop. That's it. You cannot go beyond that with, with uh, at least until i7. 32 GB is the ceiling. But with this one, you can go up to 375 GB, 10 times more almost, or more than 10 times, right? With Xeon processor. That's another benefit of it. What is the next benefit of a, uh, then what is, what does the i world, i in the i5, i7 and i9 mean? I stands for Integrated Graphics Processing Unit. So you can see here, these desktop and laptops have a display. So there is a need for an uh, integrated graphical unit. But for a server computer, I don't need a graphical processing. I just need the pure brain power. That is my Xeon with 48 cores can give me, right? So that is why I would choose Xeon here. And there is X in the notation here, but no I. I means integrated graphics. That's why you would see I5, I7, I9. For a server computer, you will never see a Xeon CPU. Okay. Another thing that you see is multiple network cards, right? Backup for a backup. Your desktop computer, as I said, can die. No problem. Right. Who is impacted? Only you are impacted. But servers dying for a mission critical operation is dangerous, right? National security could be at stake. People's lives could be at stake. Airline operations could be at stake, right? So that is impossible. We, we just cannot afford to lose uh, the connectivity of the computers, right? That's why we have a backup for a backup. And I, I don't know if you're paying attention to that video that I had shown you in the beginning. She said, the, uh, the presenter said, we have to prepare for a backup of a backup. Right? Backup of a backup, not just a backup. So they go to that second, third level also to have continuous operation from the data center. So just having a server, would that give a uh, very good, uh, um, like, you know, fault tolerance mechanism or uh, if the computer goes down, if the power goes down, what can go, what other things can go, go wrong? Other things that can go wrong could be the hard disk could fail, right? Here is a hard disk in your computer that stores your data. And if the hard disk dies, what will happen? Is this computer useful? No, right? There is power, there is RAM, there is a supply, everything else is working, but hard disk is dead. If the hard disk is dead, 
that's it i cannot do anything about it right it is as if my computer is dead as if my operations is dead so therefore in the servers you would also see that there is no hard disk in here so where is the hard disk then there is only ram there there is no hard disk right so we'll, we'll talk about that on the next slide are there any questions on this picture i hope the difference is clear to you in a summary on the left hand side i have represented the personal computer desktop on the right hand side are servers servers are high cpu high memory and backup for backup you can see there are double power supply double ethernet cards everything is double pretty much and also hard disk is not within the case here hard disk is attached outside right and we will talk about the storage on the next slide any questions on this okay all right as i said do not hesitate right don't don't be shy about it let me go to the next slide now so now here is a rack that is the fundamental build, building block of a data center right what is a rack you have seen the racks in lab also right but these racks are like you know just a steel framework but you can see that these are 19 inch in depth and you can stack up these servers right you can see you, you see this server here right just stack one after one on top of another and you can have multiple servers here right so this racks and then a set of racks are called as pods form the building block of data center right so when you saw in this picture in here what is in a data center you see this ones now in the picture on the left hand right side these are a set of racks and those lights and things those are coming from the this 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 computer here the front of the uh, uh, the servers right so you can stack up servers in a rack so now you look at this one rack you saw that there is like you know 48 cores could be within one xeon cpu and with the new advancements within a rack i can have so many servers installed one on top of another i can have 2000 cpus 2000 cores within a rack imagine that right isn't it like you know few years ago somebody would have said that this is like a super computer right within a rack and you can have multiple such racks so what is the benefit of additional benefits of rack these are designed for optimal air flow also because there will be a lot of heat generation right that could cause component failures so these are all prepared there is a cabling there is power everything is just connected to that one right so you install these racks which are prepared electronic framework with all the cabling and everything there and you just plug it into the servers and you have a rack ready with uh, uh, to support your servers in addition to that they also have sensors also which are not shown in the picture but they will give you the details about like you know the temperature humidity and all other type of uh, the sensing information which could be then displayed at the control center uh, which is the external room outside of the data center where it could be monitored if the server's temperature is going up and what needs to be done right uh, so let's go to the uh, i told you here that storage or hard disk is not attached to the computer right in the servers in case of your desktop hard disk is within the computer in case of laptop also hard disk is within that one or you can have a external one that you can connect with the cable which is not the case here right the only thing a server has is a cpu and ram on that one and ethernet and everything and everything is double right to 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 make it more fault tolerant i have explained one concept here integrated lights out management but don't worry about that one i will explain that one later so it means that even if the power goes off that it has one built in battery and that another separate cable that you can connect to it for mo monitoring purpose monitoring and management purpose but uh, we'll cover that later so you can see here a rack within a rack number of servers are stacked up on each other right there are no desktop computers within a data center okay so now we will talk about the storage right what you are familiar with 
is the left hand side perhaps you might have seen seen even hdd directly attached storage this is how if you open a computer this is how a hard disk in the old computer used to look like this is a 6 terabyte hard disk right and if you open the case of this hard disk this is how it will look like what you would notice here is a round platter right and then there is a arm and a head on it right this is like you know the old uh, the music instruments right the the recorder and then the head will move and record the sounds on it and, and, or play the sounds from it here it will do the recording and other purpose also this is a old technology right this is a magnetic uh, like you know so what what it is magnetic recording the head will move to that location and like you know um, with the magnetic field it will store onto the the magnetic platter the data that it has to save and go back to its original position if you want to read the file again the head has to go to that location and read so what does this mean it means that there is a mechanical involvement what is the mechanical in involvement the head moves across the platter whenever there is a moving part what happens you would be electronic designers in future right you would do different things one thing that you have to keep in mind is that if you are developing a system which has a lot of movements in it it is going to generate heat if it is going to generate heat you will have to provision for cooling and also it might damage if it is also moving what it means it will consume more power right whereas like if it is just electrically like you know if you build a memory store using ram right if it is ram and you are storing the data in ram does it need the movement of the head no it doesn't need the movement of a head right but what is the problem of a ram why don't we use the ram here then right because the ram is random access only read only memory uh, sorry random access memory if the power goes off data from the ram goes away correct you heard about perhaps while you were studying you heard about rom also read only memory right that is used for the bias of a computer so but is that like you know practical to use not practical to use because it is burnt in the factory with the data loaded in it you cannot change it and whereas you are creating files on a computer so that means you need something that you can read and write or delete and make this room again right so that's why you use you usually something called as a uh, a storage like hard disk which you can read write delete when you don't need the data right but see the mechanical parts in it this was called as hdd right hard disk drive all mechanical parts in it not very efficient so much power consumption right but we cannot use the ram either ram is is random access memory data goes away we cannot use rom either there is one more memory that you might have heard about uh, at least the second year third year students which is called as eprom right erasable programmable read only memory meaning that you can write the data into it and you can erase it also from that eprom but what happens is that eprom is one uh, one integrated circuit one chip that you will get right in eprom you have to expose it to the light to erase the uv light to erase the data from that one and you cannot just selectively erase the data from a eprom meaning that let's say my eprom is 1 mb and i want to just remove the first like you know uh, 100 kilobytes of data from that one you cannot do that you would either erase completely or you will have it complete so using eprom as a storage is not possible either so then the new technology came that is called as a sdd solid state drive you also may be learning about gates nand gates and gates nor gates right so these gates are used to form this new type of memory called as a solid state drive and in this one these are called as electrically ee prom electrically erasable programmable read only memory and these are forming as a new hard drive so even if you buy a new computer now chances are that you will not get such type of hdd you will get sdd which means solid state drive it is constructed using nand and nor gates that is that is the fundamental technology right it is it could be more inside one integrated circuit 
but that is the basic unit of it right and this part goes inside something like this you might have seen it also this is a samsung sdd right and this one goes inside your computer and becomes your drive clear sure. yes yes sir pen drive is also example of solid state drive perfect perfect a very good example sir pen drive is also an example of solid state drive right just the cell arrangement is slightly different right what is the multi cell versus singular cell and and the internals are slightly different uh and why then like you know why this one is structured like this why is it looking like this hdd on the left hand side this is just to take, fit it inside the bay because if you saw in the pc here right there is a slot here just like you know the cd rom and and the hard drive so just make it put the solid state drive in a similar slot so that we can in place of hdd i can put a sdd so now in all your desktop computers as sir said you have like you know like pen drives right the external drives and this is the internal sdd this is the drive you can use for persistent storage i am using persistent storage what do i mean by persistent storage temporary storage is ram persistent is even if you power off and power on the data is still there right that is a persistent storage so the new technology is this solid state drive okay but again what is the limitation can i use this for my desktop computer yes i can use it for my desktop computer but can i use it for my server computer if i have to install it within a uh, computer and if this server anything is bound to fail it is electronic right it is not going to live forever temperature many other components could come into uh, play and this solid state drive could stop functioning then you are you have a disruption in service that is not acceptable so in case of server now any any questions uh, by the way on the left hand side these two are representation of hard disk for a desktop computer now we are going to move to the right hand side i am talking about now instead of direct attached storage i am going to talk about network attached storage right so what is a network attached storage now it is going to look like this you see this one network attached it is looking like a, a block right and if you see inside that one it has a hard disk one it looks like this one right hdd it could be sdd also and there is another one and there is another one and there is another one in this picture i have shown four hdds and this whole block as called as a storage server this is not a computer right so you look at this one now so what does this look like the internal schematic of this block could be something like this you look at this one so this black colored block at the top which is called as a network attached storage that network attached storage is internally like this so it has a cpu also of its own but does it have a full blown operating system that you can use no it has a cache also it has a ram also it has a storage controller controller that you will learn about like embedded uh, computers and other things so idea is that the function of this storage server or this this one is to write on to this disk this disk this disk this disk this, this, right and see how many disks are there four hard disks so when the when like you know you ask to write the data into a file it will write it into two hard drives not in one okay so even if this one hard disk fails what happens you just remove this hard disk trash it recycle it right and put a new hard disk in place is your data lost no right there is a real time backup that is happening who is doing that this special purpose dedicated computer the only thing only purpose of this storage server computer this black one is to provide you a redundant storage mechanism and provide a nick here what i have indicated nick is a network interface card right so this one also if you look at this one i have shown two nick cards here what does it mean if one nick card fails there is another one right so now this red colored things that i have represented in the picture are your server computers okay so let's go to that server again so here is your server so one cable will come out of this one right 
and connect to this this black block here right this one and there you go you have a network attached storage nas understood the difference you learned so far about hdd sdd and you learned about network attached storage as well network attached storage is not just four hard disk as it represents here it has a tiny computer there it may not be super powerful just like our server computers with 48 cores and so forth. but it is a niche computer in the sense that it is designed for that only one purpose right to store the data into multiple disk give an ability give some more information about the state of the health hard disk right and it will indicate here the health also that oh one of the hard disk is gone bad right all of that it will provide okay so you you understood now these are storage computers storage servers you can say these are outside the normal servers do the storage server go in a data center absolutely they do right do the servers go in a data center yes right and how are they connected you would see that there is a gigabit ethernet network switch and you can also see it is just not one computer connecting to the storage there are multiple computers multiple servers connecting to the storage right so one storage server multiple computers connecting to it now what is the difference between network attached storage and san as called as storage attached to network right there is not a lot of difference but the subtle difference if you see is this one it says gigabit ethernet network switch and here it says fiber channel switch what does that mean in the first picture this pipe or this network pipe that you have to connect to the internet connect to the storage is shared meaning that if this server is connecting to the internet it is using the same pipe if it is connecting saving a file to the storage it is using the same pipe so isn't it like you know a little bit uh, like you know the one could have a impact on the other right no dedicated channel as such if somebody is making heavy use of the server transferring uploading downloading and if it is using this gigabit ethernet network switch it is going to have a implication on this one what if we create a dedicated separate channel fiber channel only for storage purpose that's for the storage attached network technology came up. that is the only difference guys right you understood now network attached storage uses existing network connection that you connect to the internet with connect to other computers with right so if this server wants to talk to another server also they will use the same storage also same connecting to the internet also same receiving the requests also same but in this case in case of a storage attached network it will use a dedicated channel okay object storage is a for another category and we will talk about object storage when we go to the cloud when when we are presenting about the cloud computing because the interface of object storage is slightly different i just included it it is here on this slide because it is a storage concept but the interface to the object storage is over the internet it is more like you know uh, accessing through the uh, on over the http protocol and uploading downloading files uh, large files you can store it in the cloud you may heard about you may hear about amazon's file storage service and you can store that in the cloud uh, it is cheaper also and and uh, uh, you store your photos also in the uh, in the cloud these days from your uh, phone those are automatically synchronized so that is using the object storage service but we will talk about that one at a time of cloud computing right uh, but at this stage this is pretty clear i uh, in my opinion then right the first two are about desktop computers the right hand side is about the server computers right and again another thing is will these servers go in data center yes how would they be arranged they would be stacked on one on top of another within a rack you have storage also and then you have this type of storage also because companies are like you know switching between the two this is for file storage this is more for block storage uh, it's like use you can use this one like a hard disk this one you cannot use it like a hard disk that those are subtle differences 
but don't don't worry too much about it from a technology perspective realize this one point that these are external devices and it could be swapped it could be taken out of for maintenance right swapped it could be ch changed the way you want without affecting the servers right that is the key point of it continuous operation we don't want a disruption in service that is the whole purpose of the data centers right we want continuous operations that's why we use servers also with multiple powers any questions on this we'll go to the next slide then uh, suhas yes yes sir uh, hard disk is more uh, favorable or uh, solid state uh, drive will be more favorable for that uh, you mean this this solid state is what is preferred sir if this i have shown a old picture nowadays sir this this one is also not used in this one because nevertheless what happens is even though it is a hdd it is not very power efficient right because it is it has a moving arm in it so it will dissipate more heat so these days for the network attached to storage also people are using solid state drive hard disk hdds are pretty much getting replaced sir. but uh, hdds have more capacity of storing uh this yeah yeah that is also increasing sir now ah. right that is also increasing now earlier you were right hdd had more capacity but with the advancement in the technologies and the fact that like you know we can squeeze in more transistors on the chip build more nand nor gates uh we the sdd capacity is also increasing now acha yeah okay. and on this side on the network attached you just uh, like you know connect in series right and you have multiple capacity you are not using one drive you are having like you know 10 20 in this picture for size purpose only i have shown four you can have such a storage server with 20 hard disk in it all hdds or all hdds hdds could be because of the old what is the maximum size nowadays for oh. ssds uh sdd let me see i have in notes it could go up to terabytes sir now terabytes okay yes yeah, yeah yeah it could go in terabytes okay thank you yeah any any other questions right the block here yellow i have shown as nic network interface card so next thing that we will talk about is the network connections right so far as far as i have tried to cover a lot of background for first year students because they may not be knowing about these things but these things are they in data center no what goes in the data centers servers which are like you know that 3 cm thick 10 cm wide 19 cm 18 cm in length and they go in a rack and they could be stacked on one on one on top of another right and one rack can have many servers right and there could be multiple such servers in the same rack you can have storage servers also okay and those could be connected with the this next network interface card so let's talk about network interface technology a little now okay i will go to the next slide and then we'll talk similarly about the network infrastructure and how things work so on the yes sir yeah block storage what is it yeah 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 very good question sir i wanted to keep it high level but yeah yeah i'll i'll tell you block storage is more like you know storing the data block by block 512 byte sectors uh, the block is stored and this is treated more like a hard drive of your on your computer so if you are on your computer if you have a hard disk you will format you will partition it you will format it and then you will uh, create it whatever partition you want and write it right that is the way of using hard disk if you are using a desktop block storage give you exact that ability if you are using this uh, storage area network and you are using the block storage you are as if you are having this hard disk if you are using file storage it is like you know you don't know you don't have much control you are storing only the files there but you do not have a control about file partitions and you do not have a control of oh this is my allocated hard disk you are like you know uh, it it is a shared storage network attached storage and you are only storing files in it this is good for one purpose sir but the block storage is what is more popular in cloud and things network attached file storage is more for i just want to save the files i don't care what the partition is how that is managed right uh, with files with block storage then you have a control 
I want to break up my hard disk into three partitions and in one partition I will install Unix and in another partition I will do another thing and in another partition I will do another thing. I will set my block size as this one. So those type of controls are available with the block storage. Sir. It is more like, you know, uh, what is faster block storage will be faster if you are using it as a server, not a file storage. File storage is more like whole file at a time. Then both the types of uh, these storages are used in the uh, yes 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 because multiple use cases are available sir some are having oh yeah I am only using it for my photo upload when you are doing a photo upload sir you do a complete photo upload you don't do a partial photo upload yeah correct so in such a case then I would use a file storage I don't care much about the partitioning and other things right in fact the object storage cloud is an even better example for that. Who takes the decision that whether it should be network attached storage to be used or storage area network to be used? That is, that is, those are the architects of your data center. They will decide that what kind of service I am going to provide. Oh, I have uh, my third year electronics, DSE electronics project uh, uh, students. They want to do some embedded controllers and some design and some projects, which is going to write some software and uh, like, you know, read the data from the file system and change some bytes in that one and that type of manipulation at a block level within a file I would go for a block storage right so what typically the data center things uh, organize is okay what do you want right in future when we go to the cloud computing uh, session I will explain more about that one in future you would be asking what I want rather than choosing it you will tell your the cloud uh, service provider that I want a block storage because I want to create a hard disk of 512 GB for one of my this student and that student. They are going to do that project, right? And another two student or another team, I want to create a 512 GB or one terabyte disk. And that will be allocated from this one. You cannot get that one GB isolated data from the file storage mechanisms, right? So more of a difference is at a use case level. Right, the use case is I want to isolate this team, this project, or even think of thinking about like you know departments in the college, right? The microbiology department, they want their own storage, own computers. I would go for a block storage, right? Another department, another storage, go for block storage for them, not file storage. It is user decided or user decided user decided so some education is required but user decided they say that they will only say what you would say sir is that i want for this project these two computers are the, these two people are going to use this server and for that one i want two terabyte of space because i am going to have a lot of uh, 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 the operating system and other software to be installed so i want a two terabyte and that's it you will automatically go for block storage but if there is like you know uh, the students from the zoology or botany department are not going to be as computer savvy. They might be just creating files and storing it. So they just need a storage mechanism for their files and then accessing it at whenever they want it. They could go for a file storage mechanism. What is right? the capacity of file storage? Uh, file storage also could be unlimited capacity. Because what happens, sir, is that depends on the capacity of your data center if your data center is having file storage drives and one is a backup for another and let's say these are like you know four terabyte drives and four plus four eight so my capacity is eight terabyte for file storage right but if i attach multiple such file storage this is this is the uh, the same principle like supercomputing sir no more we have to think in the terms of one hard disk now we have to think that hard disks are attached in a series now and giving me more capacity so the question like you know um, is what is what will be the capacity of file storage is it's user defined or the data center defined you can attach as many and you can go up to exabytes there is nothing stopping you now there is technology that exists today right and the way it is distributed is now i mean that's where the virtualization aspect comes into picture so if i am getting a file storage of like you know 10 petabytes huge storage but then is does it make sense to use all of it if it is not getting used what is the point of it or if this server is 
server is having 48 cores right or my rack is having 20 servers and therefore 2000 cores or so if it is not getting used is there a point there is no point right i mean it is an unnecessary waste of money then i am paying so much for such a expensive hardware expensive displays but not utilizing it that's where the concept of virtualization comes into picture sir concept of virtualization is using one server split that server into smaller 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 computers which are virtual computers and then each of your uh, like you know each student or each department can get a 20 20 25 30 50 servers out of that one server these are virtual computers then out of this storage also virtual file storage and virtual block storage so the, this one block storage could be in petabytes but it is sliced in the form of like you know 10 te 5 terabytes 2 terabytes 1 terabyte that is called as virtualization so it is a single device but broken up virtually to give it as a independent isolated module for uh, one team one department hr department will have 20 terabyte another department finance will have 10 terabyte something like that but physically it is single yeah physically it is single correct correct all software driven right that is the virtualization software right we will, we will touch base on that one i didn't want to cover that topic because of the so much material but we will touch base on that one since you asked that interesting question go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. okay so let's talk about the next part now that is the networking part right again we are tying everything to the data center data center is that building within that building we have power everything pulling right and there are racks within the racks you have stacked up servers right and there are stacked up storage file storage or block storage and they are all connected with this gigabit ethernet network or the fiber channel switch right and now let's talk about the network concept again like you know before i get into the data center because i'm taking into account the first year students so i deliberately drew these pictures what is like you know what makes my computer connect to the world right you saw that there was a motherboard there is a cpu on the motherboard and there are daughter boards on it in which you can insert cards to extend the function of the motherboard so what i have represented in the picture here is a ethernet card right you will see that there is there is this is a slot here that goes into the mother the, the uh, slot within the motherboard and you will see that there is a cable that goes inside this one right this is the ethernet uh, cable when you use a laptop you would see on the laptop left hand side or right hand side there is a plug like this you can switch uh, plug in, plug in the ethernet cable in there right essentially it goes to the network interface card so now your computer is not in isolation it is connected to the world because of that network interface card okay this concept is clear network interface card once have, you have a network interface card you can connect to the world now obviously another advancement in that could be a wi-fi card right you don't need a cable you can connect using a wi-fi but same thing right it is just using the wi-fi signals now instead of the physical cable now these are on the right hand side i'm explaining slightly different concepts right so look at there are three concepts that you are going to learn about one is a hub switch and router what is the difference we will see in a minute hub is you can see that hub looks like this if you think about it all of them look like this unless you look closely and and read details hub switch and router would look the same all of them have cables like ethernet cables going inside them like that if you see the slots there right so physically they look the same but their function is very very different now let's talk about hub first so if you look at the hub the hub has this five slots in there right but it could be many right analogy of a hub is more like you know you might be having those usb based adapters or usb based charger remember you plug one in the wall and then in the extension you get four 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 or five or even simpler analogy could be a power extension card right power extension card card you plug one into the socket there and now you have four power connection points there right all of them get the same 230 volt 50 hertz 
correct hub is similar to that so just the only difference could be in a hub when computer a here and server 1 b storage and server 2 these are connected with the hub now they can talk to each other when computer a wants to talk to storage what happens it sends it to the hub hub sends it to everyone okay and then server 2 says oh i don't need it ignore it storage b says i don't need it ignore it server 1 says i don't need it i'm going to ignore it. because the message was only from a to storage and only storage server accepts it similarly if server 2 wants to send something to server 1 server 2 will send it to the hub hub will send it to all of it all of them and then what will happen server 1 will say okay i will accept it it is for me a b storage will reject it is this an efficient way of communication guys it is like you know i want to now it is a presentation this is a different situation right but i wanted to talk to deshmukh sir right and we are pretend that we are in a uh, we are in your electronics lab right you might be missing the lab as i know sir told me that you are all like you know attending the sessions no college uh, presence still right so let's pretend that let's assume that we all are in lab and i want to talk to deshmukh sir or gurke sir and this is not related to this educational purpose does it make sense for me to just speak out so loud that you all hear and when deshmukh sir has to hear that deshmukh sir will hear and you ignore that is what hub is like right you are talking out to any everyone it is like you are broadcasting to the world and who is picking up whoever is interested in it that is a very silly way of communication it has its use case what will be the use case of a hub when you want to broadcast hub is good when you want to communicate to the all hub is good but not very good when when it comes to uh, providing the network function of efficient communication right what it means is it creates lot of noise on the channel also what what do i mean by noise on the channel when a is sending to storage in this picture there is noise on the channel right there is bits are transferring on the wire server 2 wants to send to server 1 but now it has to wait right or it has to like you know it, it all gets multiplexed and things but nevertheless there is a still that congestion of the network could occur it is not a very efficient use of bandwidth right i am unnecessarily getting the data from someone i didn't want to get and then i am discarding it that is the hub any questions on the hub okay let's go to the switch switch is smart right so switch terminology comes from that tstn public uh, uh, switch telephony network right so you are calling someone and the switches are connected and automatically then you are talking person a wants to talk to person b or computer a wants to talk to computer b switch will connect the them connect the two together and now the conversation is only happening between a and b server one storage and server two doesn't know anything about it okay isn't this switch efficient then right it is not broadcasting it to the world it is sending the data from only one computer to another and only the communication is happening between those two others are free to talk to uh, like you know server one can simultaneously talk to server two and those two will be connected it is typical like pstn network in our public telephony right you are two people four people are talking to each other simultaneously no issues that is a switch right so switch is good for within like you know uh, so think that now um, in our college we want to build a network right but within the electronics lab you want to have computers connected right a b server one server two and you want to share a storage so st storage is attached as well think outside of the data center for now uh, this is just within the lab so what you would have is a switch and within the switch then your computer within the electronics lab can talk to another computer within the computer uh, electronics lab no problem right so you are this is all isolated below this switch is electronics lab but what if i i have like you know another one in in like you know microbiology department or zoology department they have another lab 
right and they have a set of computers as well right so they will also have a switch and their computers but what if now the electronic computer electronics department computer wants to talk to that zoology department's computer now you are crossing the network right so such a small network is called as a subnet right that's where the router comes into picture router connects more than one network together switch connects like you know within the network right so if you look at this right hand side picture now within a router right you have two switches here so you can think this block represents electronics department this can uh, represent a computer department or zoology department for instance and they have a set of computers there and here is another department department also all of them are connecting to the central router and from there to the switches and this router can also serve one purpose router can connect to the internet so now electronics department has internet connectivity this department has internet connectivity this department also has internet connectivity because of the router do they have a router of their own in the lab no they only have a switch so switch connects to the router and from all the switches connect to the router router can connect to the internet and they, this can talk to each other now any question on this one this this is the uh, another important concept right so these what gets used in the data center hubs are not used switch and routers are used okay switch can be used as a hub no problem yes switch can be used as a hub yeah you can use like you know some conventions of the broadcast mechanism that um, okay i know that i want to talk to b right but this is a special message you send it to all so you can do a broadcast and switch is smart to know that ah a doesn't want to talk to just b a wants to send it to all so switch can play the role of a hub also if needed yeah okay all right so i think now you understood uh, so switch and router from this picture allows us to connect the servers and storage to the internet so now let's see the underpinning of a data center right so now you had seen those racks so in this picture take your attention to this gray colored block at the bottom it is a representation of a data center okay now within the data center if you see this white colored block at the bottom these are four racks i have represented right my rack 1 is only store uh, only servers right server 11 to 1n right whatever is that 19 for instance 11 server 11 to server 19 maximum right in rack 1 i this is just for i created the picture for you to understand just get the idea that 10 servers are in the rack right and there are four storage servers in rack 2 rack 3 also has 10 and this has only three storage servers you understood the storage servers right it has sdd or hdd in it right with that storage cpu and it's very specific function right to a redundant disk okay gives the network attached storage or the block storage um, and now if you look at this one this is a typical architecture of a data center so now you will see that from the servers you can see that the server uh, rack is nothing but a steel framework right in the steel framework on the back side there are cables and these cables that you would connect from each of the server and to the switch now if you look at this one from server rack 1 i am connecting to switch one here and another one here why backup data center's purpose is backup when we were looking at this example there was only one switch we didn't care about that much right but in data center you have a backup if this switch fails this rack can connect through the switch this switch right so there is always you would see that there are two lines going out like this from this rack also or from this storage also it is going to this switch and also this switch okay so then there is a aggregation switch here another this this is just a st structure to 
separate it out into multiple layers but you can think that this is this is a layers of switches right these are access switches this is covering for these two racks and these are another difference is speed of the switch higher the speed the switch is go, uh, switch is going to be expensive what kind of speed it gives one gigabit of data right or 10 gigabit or 40 gigabit that is the power of a switch right each switch has a limitation also so in here i can have a switch of lower capacity because now this is not like you know too much load but the switch over here because i'm going to get the aggregated data or at the core switch level i'm getting all the data across the data center that is going to need even more high throughput high memory uh, high high bandwidth uh, type of switch and that will be a more expensive 40 gb ethernet switch will be here right and now if you look at this one from the data center we are connecting to the edge routers edge routers are outside of the data center i have represented but these core switches i have listed these could be routers also here right i, I should have sh shown that it could be switch or router a router can connect to another router also so these edge routers why are they called as edge router edge is just a term to indicate that this is where the edge is of your infrastructure if this is your company right this this is also let's say this one is hr department this is finance department and uh, what i have represented there a b c d is the computers in there laptops computers desktops not servers their servers could be in data center these are just their desktop computers there right and they will also connect to the data center servers through the internal edge routers but if all of them want to connect to the world they can connect through the edge router to the internet and this could be an internet service provider now right and then if you are hosting some application which is applicable to the world i have represented here user one computer user two computer user three computer these could be globally anywhere right these are not necessarily in in our premises not in the not in our uh, for instance if shivaji college's campus right if we have a data center in college and if we are hosting our own site right if you if, if electronics department wanted to create an application for online electronic let's say for some um, some design related things right you put together some project and you wanted to make it available to the world so you can have it deployed here 24 7 it is running accessible to the world and people around the globe can access your server right through this infrastructure see that like you know then now you have a highly available system highly available server highly available site okay any any questions on this network architecture no sir okay okay let's go to the next one so like you know then a data center became so popular right it became so popular and uh, each company pretty much needs this one right now the cloud has it changing the dynamics but pretty much all companies have a data center all companies all it companies will have a data center if you, to run their back office operations right uh, you have o, o, the uber ola and all these apps that you use on your mobile right they have huge data center facilities and they have to have this facility around the globe right because they do not have presence uh, in just one country they are they have presence around the world one concept that you need to remember is like you know network latency network latency what does it mean let's say that there are two computers both of them are in the lab and they are sitting next to each other connected with a high speed ethernet cable they would be com connect communicating with a very very high speed correct there is nothing in between they are just directly talking to each other but let's pretend that you have one computer sitting in our lab in college and another computer is in another lab somewhere in a university in usa now that is halfway around the globe do you think that the data transfer will be at the same speed no way correct because now it has to travel so many hops so the distance increased means network latency increases the data transfer will not happen so quickly 
because the data doesn't is there is no single wire running from us to electronics uh, department lab right it goes through multiple hops what i mean by hops is the switches and routers which come in the way even if it is now electronics department as we said it will go to a switch then to the router and then to the internet and then to uh, from internet to the satellite links and things and go to the us their universities internet link from that to different routers from that to switches so what happens is the longer the distance between the two computers way too many things can come in between which are switches and routers and latency could increase meaning that the speed will decrease the amount of data that you are getting quickly will not be we will not get it at the same speed down you understood the network latency concept i the reason i am highlighting this because there is a notion of geographical data centers you need to understand that right if you are having if we are let's say we are providing a global service like ola or uber and if ola and uber like service we are providing around the globe there are customers in different countries and if we have a data center only in india do you think somebody on us will get a good experience with it because all the data is stored in the data center in india correct so that means that mobile from us will have to talk come through this whole whole lengthy line lengthy routers and switches to connect to the data center in india that means that it is not a very efficient mechanism so that's why you may have to replicate the data centers to support your business correct if you have if you want to support the business in different countries you will have to replicate the data centers isn't that expensive then i have one data center in india another one in another country another one in another country another one in another country and not only that it could go to such a level that oh we have so many users in mumbai and so many users in bangalore it is better that i create for local proximity geographical proximity and faster connection i would create one data center in mumbai and one data center in bangalore and then i would connect local user to the local data center so that they will get a faster experience if uber is not fast on your uh, mobile and ola is fast what will you use you will go to right see that that's how it spans out right that oh my god now i'm losing business because people are complaining that your app is not fast enough right i'm just trying to touch base on these points this is not what i wanted to cover but you would get an idea that you have to think that for a global business like ola uber or network airlines industry or or right they have to have a global presence right that this data centers are uh, in in geographically distributed locations and it is not just for that purpose it could be for many other purposes right uh, disaster recovery is a new term you you may have may or may not have heard right how quickly your business can recover yes sir just i am interrupting only 5 minutes remaining oh my god okay sir let me rush to the next part then quickly okay the next lecture also okay yeah yeah okay 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 all right so that this is data center then i think you know the data center standard tells you about uh, uh, the facility design cabling design what the electric connection should be these are the two standards you can uh, read about that and if you use the standards then if you are not following data centers uh, standards what your cabling will look like is this you this might remind you of in our lab or things we don't follow any standards right so it, this is how it's like a spaghetti noodles right it is very difficult to find out what cable goes to what one whereas the data center and standard tells you about structured cabling color coding the cabling and looking at the cable you can tell which cable goes to what right so this is the new thing in the uh, due to the data center standards now you understood that creating a data center mean, meaning having this building facility and and so many other things right providing the heat uh, and other sensors and other things so what what if there is an innovative idea so companies are coming up with an idea called as modular data center so you see this one modular and it is created on a production line right it is not like you just tell them they will bring such a block in your building it is equipped with racks power and everything right so you just provide power to it plug it and that's it you have all prepared right so this is a 
modular data center not just the modular data center think about our military right is this sensible to move such modules also to border now we had a little bit of a problem with china right we wanted to get a data center immediately to the border areas guess what this is another way idea mobile data center so you see that there is a container truck actually right and within the container also the same mechanism you would see that there are racks there are cables there is power in it there is a network control and you see this is a truck cut open on this side to show you what is inside right so this is a mobile data center not only that that right in fact dell came up with this idea of a, a data center in a in a block that could be lifted using a helicopter and dropped at a location wherever it is needed right all the data centers generate a lot of heat microsoft came up with an innovative idea what was microsoft's idea this is a submerged data center so you see this tube within this tube there are racks and microsoft push that one inside the sea this happened at of the coast of scotland uk right so this data center was there under the water for two years they didn't have they saved a lot on their electricity and and other like you know the cooling of aspects of it they had to obviously provide the power right and the future is like you know they are even considering using the data center in space there is a future for autonomous data centers which are like you know fixing themselves trying to resolve the problem themselves and the next one is really about cloud computing right so we will cover about the, the talk about cloud in the next one right but this is these are a few additional resources uh, i will not go through this one i would highly recommend that you take the same clip that i had seen this is this i have provided in the link there is another data set uh, like microsoft has a link about that submerged data center google data center take a look at that one see how creative they are about their ideas and like you know how do they save on the energy how the water is utilized to cool down the data centers uh, different ideas copper mesh and and, and to, to cool down the server rooms so that's pretty much that and then i think you know this is the last slide that is the like you know we'll continue with the cloud computing lecture you know in a future session so sir this is that's pretty much it we can have a question answer if needed yep. okay so if, if there are questions you can you can ask on uh, okay okay all right so uh, shall i stop sharing then sir you can uh, yes, and sir. i will i'll turn on my video I think it was very nice lecture, very very nice lecture, given by Mr. Swas Gadekar. We really didn't have any idea about what is data center and how did data centers work, what is their infrastructure. Okay, but all these ideas are very very clear. I think there is no doubt. It was a layman's language in which he explained all the concepts about very critical concepts, but they are, uh, as you know. Uh, cloud computing is the key area in the electronics and computer science and uh, everybody knows that uh, even our mobiles we, we have the clouds okay we keep our data on the clouds but what is that cloud and what is the infrastructure and how they are connected i think all the basics very fundamentals he has explained in a very nice way and i thank him uh, for for very very illustrative type of Uh, lecture he has given uh, i request our principal uh, to please uh, give his presidential speech and at 2 o'clock uh, uh, another session from zoology department is going to start so i request him to give his presidential speech good afternoon everybody good, uh, good afternoon so us good afternoon sir thank you uh, basically the lecture was very Good and informative for as far as the students of electronics are concerned. Uh, basically, I am related about computers and data science. I am a biologist. Because of that, uh, that is okay. But uh, that is a good and informative uh, your lecture for uh, um, electronic students. Not only for electronic students, but for physics students too. Uh, such a lecture should be organized. by the departments uh, one of the student which is a uh, uh, great achievement in his life 
is the swas gadika from this uh, department and we are proud of proud of you swas uh, uh, because uh, students like you which make uh, college uh, proud we are, we are also proud feeling about our, uh, our students because they are uh, doing very good in their job in their place or at their places not you but there are many students who are working uh, at different places in, con- in country and abroad also they are doing well and uh, it is a proud moment for college therefore thank you swas for giving very nice and full lecture for uh, our students My and goodness. hope you are such a cooperation same cooperation in future also thank you very much absolutely thank you sir thank you sir uh, thank you thorat sir for your presidential speech and for the uh, best art, uh, motivation for our uh, past students uh, i request dr godke to give the vote of thanks uh, with that we will end our session over to you dr godke okay good afternoon to all honorable president of today's guest lecture respected professor dr p r thora principal of our college respected speaker of today's webinar mr suhas gadekar uh, respected dr t n lokhande from science coordinator of our college my colleagues dr k p deshmukh electronic department dbt coordinator of this guest lecture series respected teachers participants and students it's really great that today's guest lecture turned out to be very successful the total participants in this event are near about 42 the participants understood the basic concepts of data center in cloud computing and its advantages applications they were also familiarized with hardware and software architect platform for setting up the cloud environment today's speaker shown us data center physical layout of building i am here to present the vote of thanks to the participants who made this event successful first of all i would like to thank to president of today's guest lecture dr p r thorat sir from our college for encouragement support and taking efforts to make this event successful i would like to thank to today's speaker mr swas gadekar for giving valuable informative and good lecture on data center fundamentals he is supporter for science and technology as well as it sector i would like to thank to all the teachers participants and students for their participation in this guest lecture i am also thankful to dr k p deshmukh sir for giving nice introduction about chief guest i am thankful to dr t n lokhande sir science coordinator of our college dr uh, uh, sorry patil madam khardekar and uh, audumbar ausare for participating this webinar thank you all of you for making this event successful with your participation it has been a great day thank you okay. all right thank you sir thank you so much thank you dr gorke for your vote of thanks uh, thank you sir thank you sir, thank sir. You. yeah thank you sir. thank you for so many kind words sir thank you so much <laughs> we are at the end of the session but i, I think yeah. i request suhas that he will continue his lecture in the next session also uh, whenever we plan that for okay uh, so yeah. in due, due course of time we will plan out that and we will continue the concept of cloud computing uh, further so i thank all the participants on behalf of the electronic department for taking active participation in this session and i request that